Okay, so good morning. Good morning. We're ready to roll? Yep. Okay. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. How are you today? Hi. Good. Let me get this uh, microphone situated here. We'll leave the, uh, the shirt on. So uh, I'm Joe, Joe Joomla, and guess what? My name really is Joe. You'd be surprised at how many people ask me when they meet me, uh, is your name really Joe? You're Joe Joomla, is your name really Joe? And yes, my name really is Joe. Uh, in February, I was in Chicago, and I met the Chicago Joomla user group people. And a bunch of the people there, that's one of the questions they asked me. And they, were, they really didn't believe my name was Joe. As a matter of fact, Mike Carson from Chicago tried to start a rumor that my name was Frank. <laughs> but it didn't work. Anyway, so today we're going to talk about um, what gets you an A-plus reputation and how do you get A-plus clients. But we could easily uh, name this session do you want to love what you do and who you do it for? That's another good way of putting this. Let me just give you a little bit of background about me. I've been in the, uh, I came through the doorway of advertising and design to come into the Joomla community. So I've been in the, the communications business for a lot of years. I started back uh, when most people didn't understand what the internet was. They thought like CompuServe uh, was the internet. And uh, for those people that actually went out on the internet, yeah, you, you're one of those people? <laughs> okay, yeah, they, they, the, for the people that really went on the internet, they were the scary people because they were getting out there into territory that people didn't uh, understand. So uh, I spent a lot of years in uh, high technology. I got involved in the, uh, I was trained as a commercial artist and I got involved in the advertising industry, and I fell in love with the, the technology side of things. So I was around during the era of proprietary equipment that did your color separations for your printers, and when desktop publishing came in, I got involved in desktop publishing and, uh, and helped companies that were big in uh, the, the traditional media transform into new media areas. And so, uh, remember, I was telling a story this morning at breakfast to, to uh, the gentleman that I was uh, uh, visiting with, uh, that uh, my boss, who was in uh, the printing industry at the time, one of the, great, the, one of the largest graphic art companies in Canada, in, in Western Canada, a guy who was on the cutting edge of technology, uh, I went into his office one day and I said, this thing called the internet, I said, you need to keep your eye on it because it's going to change the way we do business. And his response to me is, uh, just ignore it, the internet is a passing fad. And that just shows you that a lot of people didn't understand what the internet was all about at that time. 24 months later, he called me into his office and he said, okay, you're in charge of the new media department and uh, we're two years behind, so we got to get caught up. So that's the way it goes. So uh, that's a bit about my background. And uh, when I came into Joomla, I was involved uh, with the enterprise world where I was helping to take legacy systems, move them into modern uh, enterprise systems. And I uh, discovered open source around that time because of all the money that we were spending on enterprise systems. And I thought, my goodness, you know, the, some of the things that are being done in op open source technology uh, right out of the box are things that we're paying 
tremendous amounts of money for, and uh, we would be, do well to adopt some of those things. So I uh, had a hard time finding people from the Joomla community. Uh, Joomla had just come out from Mambo at the time, and I was looking for people to work with, and I, I couldn't find good people, so I had to learn it myself. And uh, I was explaining to people, Joomla is kind of like the Venus flytrap. You sort of, you start looking into it, and you slip right in, and you become totally immersed in it, and the next thing you know, uh, you're earning your living uh, from Joomla. Uh, Joomla is only part of what I do. I'm uh, a marketing company, so I do some traditional uh, marketing, but I primarily specialize in uh, new media and digital marketing. So everything that I do that's web-related, I stick with Joomla. If it doesn't work with Joomla, then you go somewhere else. Somebody asked me, you know, it was crazy. Uh, somebody said to me, uh, you know, Joe, um, uh, what do you prefer, uh, you know, Drupal, WordPress, or Joomla? And I said, you're kidding, right? You're asking Joe Joomla what he prefers? <laughs> Anyways, so today we're going to talk about how do you get uh, an A-plus reputation uh, and how do you get A-plus clients? And again, don't you want to love what you do and who you do it for? Now, not every client is a good client, and an A-plus client doesn't mean the same thing for everybody, right? This is something, uh, for some people, an A-plus client is somebody that pays their bills on time. An A-plus client is somebody that uh, respects what you do. An A-plus client is somebody that uh, cares that you're profitable. If you're doing work for people who uh, have the attitude that there's lots more from where you came from, and if you don't do it for me, I'll find someone else to do it, that's probably not an A-plus client, right? So this is a, a subjective thing. What's important to you? A-plus client should be somebody that wants you to be around next year wants you to be healthy, wants you to do their stuff. That's an A-plus client. So before we talk about the clients, we need to talk about you. We need to talk about me. Uh, do you have an A-plus reputation because you say so? Are you great because you say so? Uh, how do you go about getting that reputation? Somebody said to me, and it sounded a little bit like sour grapes, uh, they said to me, oh, you just put your name in front of the Joomla brand. And I thought, well, if it was that easy, just go for it. You know, you could be Bob Joomla, Betty Joomla, Jenny Joomla. I said, if it was that easy, you know, try it out, get back to me, let me know how it's working out for you. So it's... Uh, your A-plus reputation, you could hire a public relations company to manage your brand, to you know, put together a great website and tell everybody all the good stuff that you do, uh, all the skills you have, and how great you are. But is that what makes you good? Is that what gets you good reputation? So is this you or somebody else that determines your reputation? Because your reputation will go a long way in determining uh, what kinds of clients that you get. And I will tell you this right now, the A-plus clients are looking for you. Let me repeat that, the, the, the really good clients are looking for you. If you don't have the really good clients right now, it's because they haven't found you. If you're good at what you do, and you do some of the things that I'm going to talk to you about today, then there's people out there that are looking for you, and it's just a matter of time before you get connected. That's, uh, that's uh, the thing. Now, the other thing is, is that at an event like this, you're usually the cream of the crop that's here. I heard like the top 1% of the people in the Joomla community are here, so I'm probably speaking to the choir. But just because you know something doesn't mean you really know it, because if you're not doing it, then you really don't know it. A good example of that is backups. We all know that we're supposed to do backups, but are you doing backups? Because if you're not, then you really don't know it. You just know about it, okay? So you may be familiar with some of the concepts that I'm gonna to talk to you about in the next little while, uh, and you may know these things, but if you're not doing them, you need to do them. If you are doing them, this will be an affirmation that you're on the right track and the way you go uh, to doing good stuff. So who determines your reputation? 
I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to show you a little uh, clip here to illustrate where I'm coming from in regards to who determines your reputation. Are you great? Because you say you're great? Are you great because someone else says you're great? I think that makes a good point, doesn't it? There we got a guy named Muhammad Ali that went around screaming, I am the greatest. You know what, even my mother liked him. My mother was like an Irish lady and uh, she really didn't know anything about boxing, but she liked Muhammad Ali because he had this, you know, uh, real grand personality. He was good looking and he was running around screaming, I am the greatest. But that's not what made him great. He knew he was great and he let you know it, but that only gets attention. And then when the attention's on you, now what? It's not until you prove that you're great and other people say that you are, that you really true, truly are great and you have a good reputation. Now, this line right here, there is no doubt that Muhammad Ali is the greatest boxer of all time, period. That statement's gonna make some people angry because not everyone agrees with that. That is someone's opinion. This is subjective. But that opinion comes from a credible source. And that credible source, in this case, was a sports writer with an audience of people that respected his opinion. But there are other people in the, in the world of sports and fans that would disagree with the statement. They would say that uh, you know other uh, boxers were far better than Muhammad Ali. But this, uh, how do you prove that? As far as uh, the person who said this was, in their mind, Muhammad Ali is the greatest boxer of all time, period. That's what makes him great. So this begs the question, okay, Joe, uh, what about you? What makes you great? Because you say so? No, same thing here. This is a uh, quote that is written about me on a blog by a very prolific uh, social blogger. And he happens to work for a company that's a client of mine. So here it says here uh, in the middle, without any shadow of doubt, Joe is the best Joomla consultant in all of Canada. Now that made a few people angry because there's some really good Joomla people in Canada and they would disagree with that. But as far as my client is concerned, Joe, is the best consultant of all of Canada. And then he goes on to say why he thinks that. And this is a credible source. He uh, is the marketing manager for a technology company that's headquartered in Canada called Crawford Technologies. And they're an international company. And this gentleman is uh, Stuart Rogers. He uh, has a, a page that he calls my Perpetual Follow Friday uh, uh, page. And so you know how people you know, put on Twitter, follow Friday, and they put your names. Well, he uh, puts follow Friday, and he puts this URL up, and he says, this is my list of people who you, you should follow, and this is why you should follow them. I think it's a great idea. He gets a lot of traffic on his site, and, uh, and I'm on that page, and I'm on that page with some other really significant people. And I remember when I read this, that's when it dawned on me that I have a good reputation. And uh, I come to uh, really appreciate that. So uh, if you want the URL for this, uh, you come and see me afterward, and, and I will uh, uh, give you the, the, uh, the link for that. So again, before we talk about the clients, we still need to talk a little bit more about you. All right, so think about this. In order to be valuable to your client, you must have some worth. And you'll never get the good clients unless you're well-respected uh, and unless you respect the value of what you're worth. So if you don't value your worth, neither will your client. Why should they value you if you don't value what you do and, and what you're worth? 
Okay, so let's think about this. Let's take a look at some of the things that you bring to the table. You, know, you need to know about HTML, CSS, design, no software, JavaScript, AJAX, PHP, MySQL, SEO, know about web servers, project management, social media, mobile, what about HTML5, and plus all of that, you need to keep up. It's enough to make your head explode. So if you don't value what you're worth, you're not going to make this long term. I'm surprised at the number of people who are really good at Joomla and they no longer wish to do work for clients. They're not going to finish this race because they're burned out. And you get burned out when you don't have the good clients. If you want to get really uh, good clients, you'll, you'll enjoy what you do, and, uh, and it'll all be worth it in the end. Uh, so let's talk about burning out just for a little bit. If you don't have the good clients, you run the risk of burning out. And burning out often leads to going broke. Your business plummets. You're not having any fun. Now, if, uh, if you want to stay in the game, you have to be profitable in order to go long term. Uh, but if you burn out, you're going to go and do something out. And a good sign of burnout is, uh, and a good uh, thing that goes together with burnout is going broke. So let's look at going broke. There's two ways of going broke. There's a fun way. There's a fun way of growing broke. Here it is right here. You can sit on the beach and you can enjoy uh, a drink and, and, and be social and do no work and uh, devour all your assets and go broke. Or you can do this. You can work yourself silly and uh, get underpaid and not have any fun and still go broke. So let me ask you, if, if, if you're going to do that, which way would you prefer to, to do it? I would like, yes, we'd rather sit on the beach, right? So this is not a fun way for you to be in this business, nor is it healthy for you, nor is it good for your family, right? Because most of us here uh, are not just uh, single. We, we have uh, a spouse. We have a family, people that depend on us. So again, don't you want to love what you do and who you do it for? Therefore, you need to have the good clients. And this is uh, the rule. One of the rules of getting the good clients is you need to charge properly for your professional services. So what does that mean? What is char I, I've been in a lot of places and people ask me, well, what should I be charging for my services? And that's, again, a very subjective question. Of course, you can't overcharge for what you do, but I think that a lot of people err on the other side and they are charging, undercharging for what you do. So here's my rule of thumb for what you should be charging. My rule of thumb is it means that you like the living that you are earning. You like the living that you are earning. Otherwise, go and do something else. Right? So if you're not satisfied that you're getting out of it what you think you should be getting out of it, you have to change something. Otherwise, you run the risk of burnout. You won't go the distance. Now, here's uh, the thing that you need to understand is that you don't have to be the best coder or the best designer to have the best clients. You don't. This is something that uh, a lot of people don't understand. Yes, you have to have value. Yes, you, you have to be able to do things for people. But really, what you need to do is you need to be able to solve problems for people. And uh, the, the, the mistake that a lot of uh, people make, especially when they're new in this uh, field, is that uh, they think that they have to do everything themselves. And that's not true. Your client's not doing it for themselves. They went out and hired you. And this is a clue, is that uh, don't try and do everything on your own. Uh, look at you. You're in the Joomla community, and, and there's a wealth of resources and knowledge and expertise here, even in this room. If we were all just in this room, one company, we would rock. We would rule. We would be, we would have the best clients, because you all bring something to the table that's very, very valuable. So 
leverage this asset. My buddy lists, my Skype buddy lists are my uh, uh, venture partners, my vendors, the people that I go to to bring to the table for my clients the things that I'm not good at and that uh, are not my strengths. I have some strengths, but I've got lots of weaknesses. And the, and the problem is, is too many times people think they need to do it all and you don't. The good clients don't expect you to do it all. They just want you to solve a problem for them. So if I can uh, bring you in and, and you help me solve a problem for my client, you will gain a great reputation with the client. They don't care that you brought somebody else in. You made an agreement with them. You said, I'm going to do this for you. And they go, great. So it's OK if you bring in four or five other people with expertise to accomplish the thing that you told them that you were going to do for them. And then they appreciate it. And because they came through the doorway of you, it's like you did it. Even though I don't write JavaScript, even though I don't write PHP, my clients get those things from me because they went to me and I went to somebody and brought them in on it to accomplish what needed to be accomplished. And therefore, they see it as me delivering it to them. Let's talk a little bit about, about uh, the client from hell. What do you do if you have the client from hell? Well, you have to understand that somewhere along the line, they heard you say yes to their expectations. It might not have been what you intended. But if you wind up in a situation where you have the client from hell, the only way to get out of it is to quickly fulfill your obligations to them and end the relationship amicably. Don't, don't burn the bridge because these clients have a mouth. And they have the ability to do social media and all kinds of other things too. And uh, they can have an opinion. Everyone has an opinion, right? And then when they give their opinion about your reputation, it's out there, and then you have to deal with this. Now, here's what's really interesting about this, is that the people who charge properly for their services and understand their value, they tend not to wind up with the clients from hell. See, because usually the clients from hell are not, they lack professionalism. They are attracted to the bottom layer of the industry, the client from hell doesn't actually deserve the top-notch people, the people that are really good at what they do and that should be getting paid properly for their services. So by being properly priced and positioned, you will most likely avoid the client from hell. You occasionally will run up against them, but you'll sniff them out really, really quickly. And, uh, and then you will avoid a lot of the pain. But if you wind up in a situation where you have a client that has unreasonable expectations or they have unreasonable demands of you, you need to fulfill whatever obligations that you made for them and you need to end the relationship. And even if you're doing for them uh, what you both agreed and they prove not to be a great client for, me, for you, they're actually diminishing your ability to get a good client. You need to end the relationship. So uh, you need to get what you're worth. You have value. And, uh, and another thing that you need to understand is that uh, this misunderstanding often comes because of not clarifying your agreement with your client. You cannot leave anything to chance. You cannot assume anything because they will make lots of um, uh, assumptions. So leave nothing to chance. So I'm going to tell you a, a great story. Uh, a few years ago, uh, actually more than a few years ago, I met a fine artist. Uh, later on, uh, this lady and I worked together on marketing projects, but she told me the story uh, when she was just getting into the industry. She was uh, doing fine art. She was doing paintings, and she really enjoyed that. And she decided to have a, a gallery showing, and so she rented a, a little place, and she hung all of her framed pictures, and the theme for these, uh, this showing was uh, she painted uh, uh, farms 
and, and the landscapes with farms from Canada on it. So she had all these paintings up on the wall of these very impressive looking farm operations, the buildings and the nice houses and the fields and, and all the rest of it. And, and she brought in a big crowd and uh, a lot of uh, people came and they're you know, looking at her paintings and buying her painting. And this very wealthy farmer from the other side of Canada was really impressed with uh, what she had up on the wall. And so he went over to her, her name was Penny, and uh, he solicited her, uh, uh, her skills. He said, I'd like you to, to paint my farm. And she said, wow, this is cool. And he says, you know what? He says, um, I'll pay all your expenses. We'll fly you out to Western Canada. It's about like a five hour flight to the other side uh, where he was. And uh, you stay as long as you need to, to finish the project and uh, we'll cover all your expenses. And he made an agreement with her uh, uh, how much he was gonna pay her. And uh, she was very happy with that agreement, how much that uh, she was gonna get for doing this. So uh, she hops on a plane, flies to a place called Saskatchewan. Uh, she was going from Toronto to Saskatchewan. It's a big deal. And uh, he sent his driver to the airport to pick her up, very impressive. Drove uh, several hours because he was out in now, the middle of nowhere where his farm operation was and uh, they immediately brought her in they had dinner uh, they talked and then he said I, before you you know get started I said I'd like to show you around the property so they jumped into the uh, all-terrain vehicle and uh, he drove her and he showed her all the wonderful buildings and the barns and and the, the livestock that he had in his fields. It was, a, it was a big acreage that he had. It was very impressive. And then uh, he looks at his watch and he says, okay, it's getting late. He says, um, we, uh, you know, you want to get a good early start on the day sun rises, you know, 6 a.m. Uh, and uh, you get you, know, you want to get you off the ground running. He says, so here, I'll take you to your uh, quarters, uh, but before we go, I'll show you where the supplies are. And he drives her over to this shed, and they walk in, and in this shed are a couple of 50-gallon drums of red barn paint. And it's at this moment of time that the lights went off for Penny that this gentleman, this wealthy farmer, thought that he was hiring her to literally paint his barns and his farm. He didn't realize that she was a painter who painted pictures of farm operations. She thought that he had brought her out there to paint a picture of his farm, but he, in his mind, had decided, oh, she painted all these really impressive looking farms. I gotta get her to you know, come and do one of mine. Clarify your agreement leave nothing to assumption. Now Penny swallowed her pride. She didn't say a word. Next morning she got up on that ladder. She painted this gentleman's farm and flew back to Ontario. That's a great story. Think about that. How does that apply to what you do in the agreement? Your agreements are complex. And there's a lot of things, they, uh, but you cannot leave anything to assumption. Uh, something else that I want to talk about, skills and talent. There's something that trumps skills and talent every time. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, yes, you have to have skills. Yes, you have to be talented. But that's not the only thing. And uh, what's going to trump them every time is called honesty, and integrity. And this is a sad thing because it's so simple and yet so very few people in business understand this. And uh, I'll tell you that a, a gentleman that I wound up doing a lot of work for, one of my first Joomla sites was for a guy that had been in the, uh, the communications graphic art industry for professionally at that time for 27 years. And uh, we got to be very, very good. We had a great working relationship. And one night he said this to me. He says, you know something? He says, in 27 years of being in this business, he says, I only ever met two suppliers, two vendors that were totally honest with me and had integrity. Two in 27 years. Basically, it was a nice way of saying that almost everybody was uh, 
a liar or not truthful or cheated me or, or scammed me somehow. And that's a really sad thing. And the good clients, they want the people that are just going to be straight up with them. Um, and and you've got to wonder, why is it this way? Why are so many people in the industry that are, are dishonest and uh, unethical? It's because a lot of times they start out, they're so eager to get business that they will use uh, scrupulous tactics in order to get that business. They will underbid in order to get the business. They will overpromise in order to get the business. So uh, here's another great story that, and it came out of the mouth of the guy who actually did this, but he learned his lesson. So a fellow got hired as a salesman. And speaking of salesmen, how many people in here know salesmen tend to have uh, a reputation? Yeah? Okay. Well, here's what happens, is that a lot of times company will hire a salesperson and they will say, you've got like 30, 60, or 90 days to prove yourself. Go out and, and bring us business, bring us good, good customers. So that salesperson goes out there and they're giving it their best shot and they know that the clock is ticking and that time is uh, working against them. And sometimes they'll uh, resort to uh, tactics that are not ethical in order to get that business. They'll undercut, they'll uh, overpromise or whatever. So this guy said to me uh, one day, uh, yeah, I remember at this time, you know, in order to get my first job, I promised the job in one week. And it was a printing job. It was a big, complicated printing job. And uh, this particular firm that wanted the job uh, was willing to give him a shot at it because he promised to get them the job in a week. And this particular job normally took more than a week, and took two weeks and sometimes longer than that to properly do the job back at this point in time. So he promised to get the job in a week. He knew it wasn't going to happen, but he, he promised the job in a week and uh, got the, the, the job. And then the day before the job was to be delivered, he phoned the client and he said, Oh, gee, he says, this is really unfortunate. Um, our printing press has broken down. And right now we have like a couple of uh, printing press mechanics. Uh, and they've taken the press apart and it's all over the floor of the plant. And all our work is all backed up. Uh, it's a real mess in here. I'm just like really sorry, but like there was nothing we can do about it. And, uh, you know, as soon as uh, we get it all back up, uh, your job will, you know, be back on the press and, and we'll get, out, get it out to you as soon as we can. So the client says, oh, wow, okay, and hung up the phone and then picked the phone up again and dialed the number to the plant. In the back of the plant, he uh, had somebody that he knew personally that worked there in production and phoned the other guy, says, hey, how you doing? And he goes, yeah, I'm doing good. And he says, well, how are things going down there at the plant? He says, oh, they're going great. He says, really? Yeah. He says, oh, the guy says, oh, yeah, we have so much business. We're like going at 110% in here. He says, really? Everything is going well? Yep. Yeah, just humming along. He says, okay, that's great. Good to hear. Hung up the phone. Busted. The guy got busted. The problem is, um, when you want to get good customers, it takes time. Uh, if you are a person that hires salespeople, I want to tell you that really good salespeople, they want the good clients too. But it's a painful thing for a good client to make a change. It's not easy because there's a relationship that has to be developed, there has to be trust there, and they have to educate you. Processes have to change, relationships change. It's a painful thing to change suppliers. So they're only going to do it when the pain is higher than just continuing doing what they're doing. But I will tell you this, is that a lot of people who have the good customers that have let it slip and there are problems. I made a career out of getting the really good clients away from suppliers that were not solving chronic problems or were taking 
for granted those good customers and not giving them the kind of service and honesty that that person wanted. So those good clients, they are looking for you, the person that's good, uh, can solve problems, and that is going to be straight with them and have integrity. They are looking for you. This is a layer that exists there, and they want, they consider themselves to be of great value, and they will work with people of great value, and they want you to be profitable. They want you to be the best at what you do because you are serving them. And therefore, if you're in business and you're healthy, and they're a good customer, good customers think this way, I'm gonna keep ABC Company busy. I'm gonna find stuff for them to do because I don't wanna lose my position with that company. Because when I need something, I get it from them. Uh, one of my customers, they heard that I was coming to uh, Joomla and beyond this year. And uh, then they heard that I was going to be doing a session, and we're about to launch a website uh, in the, about the next week or so. And, they, and this person actually said to me, she said, oh, I am so glad that I found you before you went to Joomla and beyond because I won't be able to afford you once you come back. <laughs> That's a good customer. That is somebody that appreciates the value of what you bring to the table. Make sense? Absolutely. So if you are somebody that's dishonest, if you are pricing yourself and competing on price, you're going to attract, you're going to attract like a fly to light the bad clients because the bad clients do not deserve the best companies. So let's talk a little bit about uh, business killing mistakes. How do you avoid business killing mistakes? There's lots of them. This is a big topic. We're only going to touch on a couple of these things. One of the uh, ways of avoiding mistakes is consider getting yourself a board of advisors. The, I, I was uh, asked one time by a software company if I would be on their board of advisors because I was a professional salesperson uh, and uh, this company was just start up and uh, you know it was tough because they only had so much uh, working capital and they have to m make the best of it to get started. It's always the, the toughest thing to get started. So they got a person from the financial industry, somebody from marketing, somebody from sales and, and other disciplines in the business community and they invited them to be an informal board of advisors. And all we got uh, for the thing that uh, they did is we got a, a once a month a lunch. And, and we did it because we liked them. They didn't pay us, but what they did is they put on a luncheon and they uh, would have one question that they would present at the luncheon for the people that were there who had been in business and were successful and, and, and did good work and they would put out what, what it was was their biggest challenge that they were facing or a problem that they were trying to solve. And that way they got the benefit of the brainstorming of a bunch of people that had been there before and the, you know, the, the ideas. So they were smart enough not to be uh, having to try and figure out everything on their own. Now this was like a lot of years ago. They're still in business and they prospered because they did this simple thing. So they understood that you're not going to be good at everything. So don't try and do every task on your own. Get advice from people who have already been there. Another business uh, killing mistake is don't uh, make the mistake of being cheap and always just uh, looking to save money. And this is especially true in the area of inefficient equipment, the resources that you need to do your job. Uh, when I uh, got involved in the desktop publishing industry, I uh, was invited to, you know, visit this company that eventually hired me. And as I was walking through, and this was at the era when um, uh, desktop publishing was just coming in, 
And so, uh, you know, things like typography were making the move from the old uh, metal, hot metal port typography to phototypography. And I remember walking in this company and I saw this uh, lady and she had this, you know, fairly big monitor sitting in front of them. And the owner of the company walks by and he says, oh, I paid $17,000 for that monitor. Now, this was in 1991, and a $17,000 monitor uh, was a really, really uh, big investment. And I, I was astounded. I stopped and I said, why would you spend $17,000 on a monitor for a desktop publishing person, a typographer? And he said to me, well, he says, uh, this person can get a double page spread on the screen. This is my best typographer. Uh, this lady works four times faster than anyone else. He says, my return on investment for this is huge. He says, I make more money at this workstation than those three other workstations over there. So he understood that uh, the hindrance to him being uh, profitable and having a good return on investment was not making the proper investment in, in the tools that he needed. This is a very important uh, question. Do not work with inefficient equipment. You're uh, in the, the Joomla game. If you're uh, developing websites and you're using a computer that's four or five years old, you need to look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, am I a professional or am I doing this for a hobby? Sounds kind of harsh, doesn't it? But I'll tell you what, the computer that I just bought was four times faster than the one that I was doing all my client work on the week before I bought that computer. And I said, man, I said, that was really stupid. It taken me hours longer to do something that would get done much, much quicker if I had just gotten the right piece of equipment. That is a business killing mistake. Another thing that you need to do in order to get the A-plus clients, take the time to evaluate your accounts and always replace the bottom one. Unless you have the absolute best clients in your market, keep looking for better clients. Replace the bottom one. Even if they're good, always look for a better client. But one of the things, you have to enjoy what you're doing. So you may want to keep some of that make you feel good because you got to like what you do, right? But if they all make you feel good, but you're not getting what you need in order for your business to prosper, you need to make the hard decision to attract the best clients. Don't forget, the really good clients, they are looking for what you have. So keep some that make you feel good. Uh, another thing that we should talk about, can you benefit from competitors who compete on price? Absolutely, you can. Because what they do is they take themselves off the market, as far as you're concerned. In other words, uh, I uh, quoted a big project, a big Joomla migration project for a company, and it was huge. It was a very mature site, and uh, we had a bunch of guys that I got involved in the pitch, uh, and we put forward a, uh, a realistic price to do the job. And this particular potential client they went with the cheaper quote, and I'm glad they did because they proved to be a client from hell. And then after that job got done, uh, we heard back from that very same person that they were unhappy with the experience they had with that particular vendor. And I thought, well, there you go. And they had some real problems. Uh, uh, if you want to hear about some of those problems, get together with me later on. And, uh, and you'd be able to uh, hear some real horror stories of uh, what they went through. And I'm sure it wasn't any fun for the vendor as well, too. So when the client is unhappy, you're unhappy, everybody's unhappy, it does nothing, it does no good for anybody. And uh, so if you're uh, competing in your market and you lose a job to someone who undercuts you, they're doing you a favor. They just sniffed out a potential client from hell, which leaves you room to go and get more profitable work and spend the time that it takes to have those really good clients who are looking for you 
discover you, you are better off not doing hours and hours and hours of work for someone that's getting you nowhere than to have that time available to do what you need to do so that those people that are the really A-plus clients that are out there can find you. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it and picked up a few things today.